I just got done. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to the final session of the 2020 Sanibel Island Writers Conference or the Sanibel Online Writers Conference. I am thrilled that our final session is with two of our very favorite presenters and authors, our good friends, Juliana Baggett and Nick Flynn. Hi, guys. Hey. Welcome back to the Sanibel Conference. So good to be here. Yeah, yeah thanks for having us. Yeah, it's beautiful here, it's beautiful. Isn't it gorgeous? <laughs> the ocean, the trees. I hope you're wearing your sunblock. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah. And your bug spray. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, listen, you guys are only gonna have 45 minutes, so I'm gonna read your bios very quickly for the few people who might not be uh, familiar with your work and introduce you, and then I'm gonna get out of the way. And I just wanna say thanks again for participating. To everybody out there who's viewing, thank you for tuning in. I think we had a great time this year. And I'll see you at the end of the session with Juliana and Nick to say a final goodbye. Thanks, Tom, for doing this. Thanks for doing it. Thank you. So Juliana Baggett, I, I don't have time. I would take up the whole session to read all the books that both of these guys have written, you know, to, to maybe just the titles. Uh, but I will say that Juliana Baggett, she's my age. She's actually a few months younger than me, and yet she's written over 20 books. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and they've all sold very well and done, uh, you know, been critically acclaimed. And uh, her children's series, The Antibodies, is currently in development at Disney+. Plus. Um, she has written under her own name and many pen names. Her novels, Pure and Harriet Wolf's Seventh Book of Wonders, were New York Times Notable Books of the Year. Her essays and poems have appeared everywhere that is in print. Um, and there are over 100 foreign editions of her books out there. Uh, she also teaches screenwriting at Florida State University's College of Motion Picture Arts. And we're just thrilled that she's back here with us at the Sanibel Conference. She was at our first conference in 2006 and has come back many times since. And Nick Flynn has worked as a ship's captain, an electrician, and a caseworker with homeless adults. He is the author of 12 books, including the New York Times bestselling memoir, Another Bullshit Night in Suck City, which was made into a film that you all might have seen called Being Flynn. His most recent books are I Will Destroy You, a collection of poems, and This Is the Night Our House Will Catch Fire, a memoir. Nick and Juliana, welcome. Everybody, enjoy what they have to say. Take care. Thanks, Tom. I think we were supposed to decide like who was gonna talk first. Yeah, I think you are. I think I have a feeling that you should talk first. <laughs> I, I, wanna, I wanna hear what you have to say. I'm really thrilled to be here with you. And uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, good to hear you. I'm really glad that they put us together. And yeah. to talk about different genres about, you know, because, you know, one thing you have, you know, we talked briefly uh, before this, and you have written in many genres. And I've written in some, not as many as you, I don't think. Uh, well, maybe I can lure you, lure you into them. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll talk about the, the idea of genre, too. And we'll, I, I'd like to talk about just even what genres are. And, like, because I, um, I sort of broke down my last book, and I think I found, like, 10 different genres within the last book. So, but I, I might be getting the idea of genre wrong. So why, why don't you start? Uh, well, I like that idea. Cause I like the, uh, you know, if we're going to talk about boundaries we should probably talk about crossing them. You know what I mean? And and also that the, the best food is always found when two or more cultures and boundaries kind of, you know. Fusion. Uh, fusion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, so I, I'm very curious to hear about that book. And cause I tend to, I tend to wall them off a good bit when I'm in them, but um, you could be reading a novel of mine and not know that you're also reading a poem that I kind of took and maybe altered to make more casual sounding or more, you know, less heightened, but it's exactly the poem kind of shoved into a novel. Does, it, does, it, does it exist in both places? Does it exist in the, in the, in the poem book, if you've written a poem book about it, uh, and it exists in the novel, yeah. Yeah. Has, anyone ever called you? Has anyone ever called you on it? Yeah, just one person. And I was so excited because I read the book of poems. That's the other thing is that when you're in multi genres, I don't know if you felt this way that like one will get jealous of the others. Have your, like, because your memoirs have, you know, sold more than I'm assuming, <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> have had more readership. Than you. Does your poet ever kind of pissy about it? Like, wait a minute, why am I not getting as many readers? Not, not, you know, not always. Actually, <laughs> my, there's, there have been books of poetry that have sold more than some of my memoirs I've written. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I'm not sure what that says. I once once I did a reading at a, a place, a poetry reading at a place, and a, a woman came up to me afterwards after I read the I read to them, and I and she came up and to have me sign a book or to buy a book to sign, and then. When she looked at me, she goes, wait, you're not Vince Flynn. And <laughs> she had gone to the entire poetry reading assuming I was Vince Flynn. It was very impressed by the, uh, and then she got really, she just turned and walked away. She was, she thought I had tricked her or something. <laughs> yeah, so, I, got, I got mistaken for Haven Kimmel once in a, in a bookstore. And yeah. I was like, oh, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, um, but then I, you know, I had, to, I had to tell them the truth that I am not a girl called Zippy. Although, weirdly, one of my nicknames in high school was Zippy, because huh? I laughed bag it and I was fast runner so Ziploc bags it happened that happened um <laughs> but I mean I think that for, for me you know I really like writing across genres because it takes me out of authority you know what I mean and I and I really only kind of think of myself as a fiction writer you know kind of that's my main um core identity and then um so when I'm moving into those other areas for me it's a way to be playful and not enough not an author in authority over the work and um, my work is generally not good <laughs> when I'm being an, a, an authority within it, you know, and I'm kind of stomping around as an author. So for me, every time I move out of my primary genre, which is again, like kind of arbitrary anyway, but um, I feel like I can be playful and, and be a novice and no one's watching, which no one's ever watching anyway, you know what I mean? But there's this idea of the critic. And when I'm in genres that I don't think of as my primary i don't think of the critic as much i really feel like i can be more playful and so then you know the lessons that i've learned in moving in other genres and writing in other genres and then sometimes the same work moving through different genres i think it's always made me better in my primary genre or just maybe not better but they're certainly transferable lessons i would say but, but even within your primary genre of fiction just to break down because I, I actually had to go to wikipedia to look up what genre was because i wasn't totally sure and they have they listed like seven genres but within like under the realm of fiction i mean there's a lot most of these seem to fall under the realm of fiction anyway and you do you do i know magic realism type things sci-fi uh ya and those are all those would all be different genres within the umbrella under the umbrella of fiction right yeah yeah the subgenres or whatever and, and actually we just say genres different genres and yeah. there's that feeling too of like yeah because i really don't think when i'm writing sci-fi i don't feel like i belong there either um i feel like i'm kind of sneaking into some somebody else's city you know <laughs> and uh taking all the good stuff but you, you've you've been you've done that a lot though you've done it i mean you have the whole trilogy of, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and again, that's because my my roots go magical realism back, you know, to being yeah. in love with Marquez and and that kind of thing, and then kind of spinning it more sci-fi. But but when you say fiction, does that mean that you're more into like just sort of realist fiction, like? Uh, like yeah, more yeah. I, think, I think that when I first started out, I well, first I wanted to be a playwright because my sister was in New York and she was on, you know, she she was on on stage she's a director she's an actor and i i saw the chain smoker in the back and who was in charge of the words and i was like really drawn to <laughs> and for all the wrong reasons probably but it's really drawn to um that you know person and then um but then when i first started writing I, it was really magical realism that i loved and then the publishing industry kind of at that point at least was just um you know didn't want any of that kind of stuff very much i mean it, in general i mean they wanted marquez but and again, you know, they didn't want my uh, version of that. So I really had kind of realism beaten into me. And then when I was allowed to finally kind of do something else, um, all my love for all of that kind of came rushing back. Um, and so, I mean, it, you know, sci-fi again has such its own very clear, you know, literary tradition. And I, I kind of come, I kind of fit and I kind of don't. But again, I like that not fitting that again, I'd rather not fit that's a much more, not fitting is more comfortable for me than fitting. And I'm wondering if that is, I don't know. I, here's my question for you, I think, <laughs> is that sometimes when I see a poet and I think that of poetry and fiction and that nonfiction is the bridge between. So when I see a poet and they're right, start to write nonfiction, I feel like they're on the bridge 
and prose there, and then they're going to start writing fiction. And then when you see a fiction writer starting to write essays and getting kind of closer to the bone of their own experience in nonfiction, I feel like eventually they're going to want to be more and more and more essential, and they might land in poetry. So I'm curious, how what do you think of that theory? If you've ever land, you know, wanted to land in fiction, and if I'm just that doesn't work for you at all. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I'm going to drift completely or, or or move over to fiction. I'm not sure. I might, uh, but because um, uh, I, I feel like it, this, I'm still sort of fascinated with uh, um, what nonfiction does and what uh, memoir does. That that it uh, it has a it has this lyric element. This which is the poetry feeds the lyric element, and then there's, but there's something that's sort of actual measurable in the world. You know something that happens, something you can describe, something you can sort of try to understand and sort of your perception bounces up against that. And if I was completely in a fictive world, I'm not sure if I have the muscles for that, like the to, to create an entirely fictive world. I'm not sure if I have that impulse or understand it even. Like, um, I think I'm sort of barely in this world. And so to create like another world to me would be maybe terrifying. I mean, I think it'd be, I'd, I'd be afraid I'd just be, I'd never come back from that experience so do you have the inclination to lie though because <laughs> as a fiction writer i'm a liar you know what i mean like it's, you know a novel by or you know big fat lies by you know um well i do my i do my best I, I, you know it, not being honest is like a daily practice you know yeah. something that i have to sort of like keep steering myself back toward yeah. uh you know because there have been periods of my life where i've drifted away from that and so Maybe to have a job where my job was to lie would be, uh, you know, maybe not the best job for me. So uh, <laughs> it seems like a lot of people's jobs, though, are to lie. <laughs> it seems like ninety yeah. percent of people I know. <laughs> when we get into like, like when you broke down, we sort of broke down fiction into these other, you know, you can get into magic realism, you get into, you know, this, this the Carver. I, I assume you were talking about sort of a Carver thing. I came up with Carver, which was not what I could do. I couldn't really do what Carver did, which I loved. I loved his work, his sort of distilled fiction. Uh, but I was more reading like things like, you know, Borges and Calvino and like things that were more like stranger that were, and so I was more, and then and then it just sort of, that led me to poetry. That was the fiction that led me to poetry. Yeah. Um, and uh, where you could, cause I do feel that poetry can do things that fiction does. It can move very quickly, uh, but move in the way more that like a, a uh, you know, Calvino or uh, Borges would do, uh, where and sort of anything can happen uh, in that in that yeah. realm. Actually, yeah. one of my first short stories, the editors accepted, and they said, I think it was my second story. They said, but we have to put um, inspired by Calvino, Italo Calvino, under it because it's so <laughs> clear. It's not his. It's not you're not plagiarizing, yeah. but there's no way we can't acknowledge that in some way. And I was like, that works for me. Calvino esque, they could say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was thinking like with memoir, like or would I, you know, my my nonfiction books have all been called memoir. Um, and I'm I'm not I'm okay with that just because it's sort of a the wild west of like of genres for me. It just feels like anyone can write a memoir in some way, or many people do. There's memoirs by rock stars and there's memoirs by, you know, you know, there's a whole it, it, it's a it's a wide tent and sort of wild. Uh, but within that there's like sort of journalism. There's new journalism, like before that, like in the nonfiction realm, there's like journalism, new journalism. Then we get into like, you know, sort of nonfiction, and then we get into memoir, then lyric essays, braided essays, creative nonfiction, sort of this sort of timeline of like how much lyric energy you can put into it, you know, where the journalism is more or less. And then as you sort of go further, then it gets just on that other end, it gets into the poetry world. It sort of starts to become poetry, I think. Well, the, the thing is, I mean, as a screenwriter, I, I teach screenwriting, so I teach screenwriters yeah. weirdly. And to me, the closest thing to the screenplay is the poem. Yeah, you, you so, call it a plot poem. I saw yeah. it in an interview. You call it a plot poem. Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I, I, what I think of is like both of them have to earn the white on the page. There's so much white on the page of a screenplay. There's so much white on the page of a poem. Yeah. Uh, and I think of it like as like little houses with snow, like piled up and around them and they have to kind of hold this burden up and how they do it is different a lot of times like the you know the poem is doing it with with language and with image you know what i mean and it has to you know bear that weight 
and then the the screenplay has to do it with image you know what i mean or dialogue or plot like it has to keep moving and has to have the speed that moves through it so yeah you know if i think we were just like scanning pages like those look a lot more alike than the dense prose dense prose dense prose of the memoir or the the essay or the you know fiction i love that image that you have of the the houses in the snow these these things um i you know i was going to say that about my last memoir just I sort of thought about genre just before I went into it. The one, this is the house, or, or, this is yeah. the night of the catch fire. What are the nine genres in it? That's what I want to know. Sure. Well, there's actually, like you had said before, you've, 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 you know, inserted a poem directly from a thing. I have a poem that's in my last book of poetry that is basically just put into this thing. And then there's a few chapters that are, you have to look clearly, they're long lines, but they're actually, there's line breaks in them. There's, mm. They're not like actually, and, and I just needed to have sort of that sort of energy in those things. Like you, you have to look, you have to see it, but they're clearly poems. If you sort of look at them, they don't go to the end of the line. So they're sort of, they're, pat, they're lineated. So there's poems within it that are sort of, you know, hidden, smuggled into it. I didn't want to scare anyone with them. There's, there's actually plays in it too. There's actually just sections of pure dialogue with like characters saying the things like, you know, uh, characters with their, their names on it, like in a play. Um, there is, I know you work with fairy tale also. So there's, there's the whole thing began, it's sort of drifting. It's a memoir. Like my earlier memoirs were more in the realistic, in the realism realm. And this one was really drifting toward fairy tale, like taking elements of fairy tale within it. Um, it, it you know, it's based on a, a, a story I'd tell my daughter when she was seven. And it sort of had, we were reading a lot of fairy tales and we sort of took on the air of a fairy tale in the telling of it. And that's how, that's how the book began. Um, there's, uh, a little, you know, mag either magic realism or like Ovid, like there's a person turning into a beast in it, uh, you know, becoming a beast within it. Uh, so that's that's something. There's uh, there's a bit of confession in it, uh, you know, the idea of confession. If that's a genre, probably some kind of a genre. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to, you know, I, I wouldn't use it as a self help book or a how to book, but you know, someone might do that. <laughs> Dangerously, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't like, stand behind it. But, but basically, it falls under. There's a there's a French term in France. I don't know what your books have published, but in France, they, they don't have a word for memoir. They don't really know what that means, or something. Or it's not there. They, they they call my books receipt, R E C I T, uh, which is um, there's a really beautiful definition of it, which I will actually I pulled up and will read for you, because uh, I that's sort of what I want to do is to just write receipt. So I would, I would like to put that on my. American books too, but it come from received, recept, recept, uh, well, it's it's um it's a French term. Receipt is a French term for a type of writing that is not the narration of an event, but that event itself. The approach to that event, the place where that event is made to happen. So it's the idea. That it's like uh, when you talk about poetry and you say that a poem isn't about anything, but it's an experience. It's the experience of reading the poem. Mm. Uh, and that is so. It's it's the event itself. The, the reading of it. The recitation. They're talking about kind of like the recitation, the, the that that the, the experience of it. Yeah. It must come from that in some way. Yeah, I, I, I should look up the etymology of it. Yeah, and see yeah. where the seat comes from. Yeah. Oh, look, somebody looked it up for us. Somebody yeah. down below. That's so good. Oh, I that's like that. good. Yeah. Yeah. I always love. I love when that protest in French is manifestation, like yeah. it's a manifestation of you know what can't be seen. You know what I mean? Like this, this wouldn't exist if that other shit weren't going on. You know, as opposed yeah. to. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the manifestation, yeah, and a, and, a, and a store is a magazine. I like that too. <laughs> um, um, so, yeah. you're, you know, we could talk more about the, um, you know, uh, uh, the screenplay stuff, like how that's different. Um, uh, I'm, I'm interested in that because you're doing a screenplay now. You're working on one now. Or? Um, yeah. Oh, well, actually, I am, but that's it's uh, just it's based on a short story of mine, not anything that's um, you know optioned during development. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I think honestly, I, I taught the novel seminar for a while, a couple times in my life, and I've taught groups of people writing novels, and I always feel like I'd much rather than take a screenwriting class and then do the novel. It's kind of like a, you know, um, if you know how to write a screenplay, you know how to um do the the pencil marks on the on the canvas before you add the watercolor i, I love it when you always see like the original in a painting behind the, <laughs> you still see those marks to see it is, is this to scale you know whereas 
not at least when I first started writing novels, I would just start oil painting layers <laughs> in one corner of the canvas and be like, God damn, I hope this is to scale, you know? <laughs> and so uh, screenwriting so helped. You, you see the screenplay, like a screenplay as like the, as like, that's so interesting. It's like the, the, the ghost of the whole book. And then, and then the, the book could be filled in uh, from that. It's so interesting. Yeah. Uh, and it's very agile, like you can make a change and change, you know, it all the way through. And it, it just, its ramifications aren't embedded in every line, you know, in this really gritty way as in a novel. I, so, I, have, I have my students do a, a, an exercise um, where, and, and I often use uh, uh, Carol Churchill's uh, play, Love and Information. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just a play where it's just like, you know, there's little short sections of people talking about a subject. It'll say like, you know, uh, shame or something and then it'll just be they won't even have characters names it's just each line is a different person talking and we just sort of read we perform those and then uh you know they they have to sort of do it make do a performance in like five minutes they have to sort of get it and decide the characters and then sort of do them and then we write from that like we sort of take one of their things and write and just a pure dialogue like two people talking uh, about mm -hmm. something and it, it really is like this it's such another way of like entering into the work where yeah. don't have all the props you know, they're not, you know, they could pick something up and talk about it, but it would be, it would be kind of weird. Like, here's my cup. I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to right. describe the cup now. And usually it doesn't do that. It's really just people yeah. having, a, you know, conversation between each other. You know, well, that's why I love theater and improv because it's, yeah. it's the truth of writing. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I always have this idea that I'm writing, but I'm really just improvising, you know? Yeah. I really don't know what I'm doing in, this, in a moment-to-moment -moment way. Well, yeah, we hope not. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the thing. We, we want to sort of have that sort of that energy, that wild energy of um, mm -hmm. of each moment is sort of like a high wire act where you're not really sure if this is going to work at all. And the good thing about writing is that 90% of it doesn't work. I mean, most of it doesn't work. And then well, also in memoir, I'd be curious about that because you do have at least the illusion if you know how it worked out. You have the, that illusion, right? But what, but if, what if it didn't work out? Yeah, or it didn't work out, but you have the, but you're still processing on the page. So, you know, um, it, it, it's still, it, it's still improvisational. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's, it's totally, and I, I like the story itself, like that, the, the sort of short story you can tell about like what your memoir is about is for me is, um, it's not really the memoir. That's not the work at all. That's like some, that's other, another thing. That's, it's not even the bones of it. It's not even like the, the ghost of it, like with the, the dialogue, like that's even much more complex. This is sort of like, you know, if you say like, I'm writing about my, you know, my father who was homeless and uh, you know, me encountering him, like, that's like, that doesn't even get close to what the, the work is to, to write that book. You know, it, even if I know those, you know, I know those things. And then the actual act of like going in and describing the place he was in, it took took years. I mean, it took years to like to even though I'd been there. Like so, but you know what? You know, it's it's like with anything. I think it's probably with fiction too. It's choosing what you're going to describe. Like why that? Why is that door there? Why are you talking about that door and not you know the, the five other doors in the room? Like why? What's important about that door? So right. Yeah. So right. It has that same energy. I think is. I think so. I think there's a lot about fiction too. Like in this, oh, there's also fiction stuff in this book because I enter into my you know, my mother's mind. I have her talking. There's, whole, there's a whole section of it where it's just my mother, you know, my mother, uh, her internal dialogue, uh, mm -hmm. many pages, you know, which is clearly not real. It's not, it's a, that's a fiction, right? Like, can yeah. I, are you allowed to do that in memoir or, you know, can. Yeah. Or are you almost beholden to in some way at a certain point? You know what I mean? You know, you do, if that's what we need in order to see you process, then, we need that. And, and you know, but I, I, I do have that sense of like, I, I do have a, a code, you know, I have a code going into like nonfiction that I'm not going to like sort of just create something out of cloth. Like what she says is I, I base her in this section in, um, in one scene. It's her, like she would make donuts. I, the book is about sort of me when I was seven talking to my daughter when she was seven. So it's, it's sort of our lives. I become like a seven year old. And when I was that age, my mother would make donuts at like five in the morning at a supermarket. And we'd go there, like often she'd have to take us. She was a single mother, so she'd take me and my brother and, or just me, I don't know. We, but I was, I remember being magical, being in the supermarket at 5 a.m., my mother making donuts, you know, get, we get to eat the donuts, but we'd also just wander the whole supermarket. I would wander alone in this dark supermarket and just eat food and just, you know, do whatever I wanted. And um, so I, I, I located her in that space, which is, a, you know, which is an actual space. It still exists, the supermarket still exists. and. Um, and so 
you know, and it, it's all like her, a series of men who are sort of coming to see her there. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, my mother had several boyfriends when I was growing up. And so these are like the guys that would sort of and I have them coming out looking for a donut in the morning, you know. So it's all within the realm of like what happened. Uh, and, and it's located in, time, in a recognizable time and place. It's like you could go to, you can still go there. And, you know, I've gone there with my daughter and actually bought a donut there still, you know, so that someone else's mother made, you know, at 5 a.m., I guess. That's great. Um, yeah. But so great. It, it did feel like it needed, and I'm not sure. See, I'm not sure for a memoir if I feel okay with entering into the mind of someone who wasn't a blood relative in some way. I somehow think there's some mythical. Well, too, in this case, you're her monster. So, you know what I mean? <laughs> she created you. So, <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that before. I've never, I've never thought of myself as my mother's monster. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'm going to sleep on that and go to therapy, <laughs> therapy tomorrow and talk about it. <laughs> to do questions is there supposed to be a time for questions i think we still have time right um yeah i mean my mom has given me permission she just said you can write anything you want about me anything at all you can write anything you want and i think it was part of that is like you know she just well also i've been pretty you know good to her but um <laughs> she did recently good, say to that. Writing? good to her in the writing you mean or good to her in the writing you know because she was uh, obsessive compulsive disorder and she it was hard for her to raise four kids but um you know so I, and i have a very sweet take on on that you know i think a generous i think she'd say generous take again too <laughs> but um yeah i think it is different in in that um you know that you know I, i'm very careful like i didn't i had a you know siblings and i didn't none of my novels had siblings until you know uh, recently you know because i was very cautious about not wanting to, to write about my siblings and Oh. I did. I felt more protective of them or something, and but now I now I do. You know, yeah, it's hard not, I, I even in a novel, I would think it would be hard not to have like you know a mom in it or, or a dad or something. <laughs> yeah, and they're always my mom. That's the thing about that. We talked about this a little bit in, in coming to it. Like I get to uh, my obsessions. Like if you're writing, your mom is always your mom. Um, my mom, I can pretend that she's not my mom in a, in this novel or that novel or another novel. You know what I mean? But it, it is always my mother. You know what I mean? I, I get to when I move to a different genre, I and in in a different world or fantasy or whatever, or in moving, um, I can really hide from myself the truth. And that's the thing that I really like about fiction that I yeah. would be very it would be very hard for me to give up. I mean, I write essays, but it'd be very hard for me to give up because I really do like the idea of the veil for myself, you know, the veil of fiction that I'm hiding. I, I can go in, go for the jugular. And then when I'm on tour, somebody asks me a question and I realize in, in the interview, like, oh shit, that is my mother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going yeah. to I'm gonna have to take a minute, you know? <laughs> um, in, yeah. And what I've done with that is, um, like in poems, like I realize it with poems, I mean, the fiction element of poetry is is the persona poem, where yeah. you you get to take on a persona. And you know, I find that I found it thrilling too. The times I've done it is like you know, I have a whole book of it's a in, in persona, and um, there was something about it that was like you're saying it was so liberating because I was I was able to my first book of poems, the first book that came out was poems, and it was very lyric. Oh, is this Huber? Blind Huber? Is this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. have I have a poem about I think about his wife, but oh. in a, yeah. For, and then I found your book, and I was like, oh well, there you go. <laughs> she, was she real? His wife? Does she? Does he have a wife? I don't know. I think, or maybe that I can't remember. It was a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. But I, I'll, I'll find it. I'll, I don't know that it ever went in any of my books, but I remember here seeing him. You know what? Maybe it came from. Is does does uh is it in um. Various antidotes. Does Joanna Scott write about Huber? Yeah, yeah she wrote about Huber. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. who I. That's so maybe it's not. But just so you all know, all, all you out in, in 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 you know Sanibel Island land, um, Huber is a French, a blind French Swiss beekeeper from the 17th century uh, that studied bees, um, and we have both now written about something around him. So. Uh, me uh, vaguely, you a whole book. <laughs> I, I, I had a six year, six year affair with you know, mm -hmm. humor. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, there's, but there's something about persona that allowed me to, um, like the first book was lyric memoir. Uh, I mean, lyric uh, confessional or neo-confessional poetry. And there is something constraining about that because you don't want to, 
you, you can show yourself in a bad light, but like there's certain there's certain realms of like emotional experience that seem sort of off. Like it was hard to be sort of like gleeful when you're writing about like your mother's suicide or something, you know, to have like sort of like, you know, to have these complicated emotions that are not like sort of what, what is sort of within the realm of uh, uh, recognizable human experience. But if you're writing from the point of view of a bee, then you're able to be like strangely small hearted when the queen gets killed uh, and, and, you know, have, have certain amount of, uh, uh, you know, pleasure in, in destruction. And uh, there's all sorts of things that could, get released and it was really it was really liberating to, to do persona yeah which i think is probably what, what fiction writers probably feel uh, well i i did a book um called lizzie borden in love of poems yeah. all in different voices and, and women and in looking back in some ways that i feel like my most intimate you know because i was allowed to be my my most <laughs> vulnerable self in those poems you know yeah and cool. that offloaded all of the you know, perceived shame, <laughs> perceptible <laughs> shame right. or yes. fear or whatever. There's that, there's that sort of presentation of self that we have, like we're sort of this performance that we do of who we are and who, how we want to be in the world, even though, you know, I push against it. I mean, I, you know, in my books, like, you know, you might not like me if you read my books. It's not like I'm trying to present like some idealized version of myself, but persona does allow you or fiction does allow you to go even further into a whole nother, that empathy. You talk about empathy a lot in your interviews and uh, you know, like what, why we read and why we write is sort of to understand the other, uh, to yeah. have that. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's that act of empathy for your mother, you know what I mean? In that moment. I mean, I don't know how that, that section in the book reads, but yeah. at least it's that you're trying to get within, you know. And it really was, yeah, I was trying to understand her at that moment or, you know, for she's, you know, was impossible at the time since I was six years old. It was impossible yeah. to, to understand, you know, there's just, you know, parents are, are what they are at six, which is, you know, my, my daughter seems so perceptive, but maybe I, I you know, I, I might have seemed utterly, you know, incomprehensible, inscrutable to her, mm -hmm. you know, although she seems to know me completely, but it's strange. Yeah, yeah. it's, I mean, it's great to be, I, I mean, I've loved being a writer with, you know, having raised kids, it's definitely um, see, being seen by them, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, we also write books for them too that they can read, which is yeah. But my kids don't read my books necessarily. I, my my oldest daughter just started reading some of my books, um, and she read Pure. I wrote it. I wrote Pure for her in a way. But um, yeah, I don't really talk about being a writer much. I mean, I talk about like they hear me bitching, you know, you know, like we are a family that of fishmongers who sell fish. Like you're going to hear us talk about <laughs> books in that way. Um, but in terms of yeah, reading my work, I really kind of keep it separate. Um, even like the Anybody's or Prince Family Park. I mean, I remember one of my kids came home um, from school and it was a read aloud because it was on the Florida Book Awards. The Anybody's was, and um, he just stared at me. He just like watched me. He just hawked me like, <laughs> are you like a double like, who are you? You know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, that's sort of a magical yeah. experience to suddenly have your his mom's voice like in the room with everyone like reading it out loud in the room. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, the question we just lost it. Like I think about um, is there a specific genre that you find more challenging to write about, and if so, why? You want to take that one? Well, yeah. my, my answer to that is that that's the reason why I'm cross genre. Like, I write across genres because when I get really frustrated and limited in one genre, I move to another genre. So. Um, I was not a poet. I did. I, I felt unco very uncomfortable writing poems, um, which when they were, you know, suggested for class assignments or in a poetry workshop or something in undergrad. Um, but then, and I, but I married a poet, and so when I started, when I had my second child, I had very little time. <laughs> my time just shrunk considerably, and I suddenly had like a lot to say. I was really kind of like, wow, I'm very betrayed by motherhood. <laughs> no one, no one has has explained this what this is going to do um and so i keep telling dave you should write a poem about blah 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 and the betrayal of motherhood and you should write it this way and you should and he's, he just i he's like i really it's not my territory you know <laughs> and so um because my time shrunk and my kind of like uh need to express especially like thought like epiphany like feeling and image and what i've been fed and processing it in a different way and it I, so I, it, poetry really worked because I could do a smaller space and a bit more like electrified and then just walk away. You know what I mean? I didn't have to do rising action, opening and closing doors, they're eating now and they're fighting and now we denouement. Like I didn't have time for that. And I also didn't have patience. I wasn't interested. 
and that that wasn't going to help me get through what I needed to get through. So, um, so that's, it's not that one, it's that, that it's not that I like one or one's easier than the other. It's that at different times in my life, I need one more than the other. And so that's why moving through them has been so helpful to me just as a human being. That's really nice. Yeah. That you need them at different times. Um, I sort of, you know, I started out as a poet, um, you know, after I tried fiction when I was younger and then I, I, I moved into poetry and that sort of seemed to match more the way I thought, uh, the way the world seemed to me sort of lined up more with it. Um, and, you know, the memoir sort of came, you know, I wasn't sure what it was going to be like. I don't know what the books are going to be before I write them. Usually I don't have a sense like, um, uh, at least that was true in the beginning. Like I didn't know if, what it would turn into, it would turn into a poem or uh, turn into a, a book. You know, I hadn't written a, a of prose, um, but you know now now that I've done it, that I've done a play also, and I mean I, I I would say like challenging like the the play was was challenging in a way, but in a thrilling way, just because you know I, I got to work with like actors and actually have actors like moving them and to see actors moving things. And I wrote about some of the same things that I've written about in my poems. Like there's a image of my father uh, putting like a pulling a trash bag up on on his body, and it's in a, I have it in a poem, I have it in my memoir, and I have it in the play. And it's just to see it in these different forms appear and to actually then to, not to, in the play, not to have to say anything about it, just to have someone do it mm -hmm. and like, you know, have no comment on it. And while he's, he's saying something, you know, he's just sort of like, you know, talking about something else, actually not drawing any attention to the fact that he's putting himself in a trash bag. Mm -hmm. uh, and just to have it exist on those different levels is, is really thrilling, uh, which is a, a thrilling thing about genre too. Like, uh, or just writing in different um, uh, these different registers, uh, because each one has its their own requirements. Each one has its own their own requirements, and so in a play, you you don't have to talk about what the people are doing because they they can see the audience can see what they're doing, which is really like like it, it, when I when I realized that when I'm like oh they'll just do it like they you don't have to have them like the people are actually doing it in front of you and you can see it. I don't have to describe it. I don't have to say like. Hey, why are you putting yourself in a trash bag? Mm -hmm. Like that would be dumb in a play. Whereas in prose, you need to say that. You need to actually have have that described. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I actually would like to write a play. That would that's the one thing because that's where I started out. So I'm jealous there. Sorry. Um, do you begin with a story and then find the genre to best share it, or do you start with the genre and then um, write the story? Um, some are so part and parcel. You know what I mean that they come together can kind of conjoined um but th there are definitely times when like pure for example was me just in a short story trying to do my best george saunders um inspired piece you know what i mean and it was about a, a 23 year old who um has a doll for a head instead of a fist she has a doll head instead of a fist and she wears a, a gold toe sock over it, and it's about the guy who's coming up to coming to break up with her, but he can't because her mother's coming to town, and her mother's really hard on her about having the doll head. It, the story, no one wanted to publish this story. <laughs> no one. Everybody was like, "What are you do? What is this?" And um, and then I thought, yeah, there actually is something here, but it's so much more interesting if it's somebody who's just moved out of childhood and they want to get rid of their childhood and they're kind of ashamed of it, and yet here they, this doll is with them, and so you know, somebody who's like. 15, 16, that's much more interesting than how did it get fused? Now I'm in sci-fi and you know what I mean? So there are times when you try it one way and it doesn't work and then you try it a different way. Yeah, that's great. Just just metaphorically, it's so it's yeah, it's an amazing thing in that with that image of the, you know, the girl with the uh uh the doll head for a hand. It's just like, you know, like trying to like you know, move from childhood, but like you're stuck, you're stuck with it, you know. Um uh yeah, I you know, since, I mean, since mine are like, uh, Julianne and I had talked earlier, I think it was earlier, or maybe it was during live, maybe, I forget now, I can't keep track of time, but about how, yeah, we did, we talked about it live, like how a memoir, the story's already there. But mm -hmm. I see, I, don't, I just, for me, that's not really true. It's usually just a glimmer of something. I, I'll just sort of be writing, you know, I do like daily writing anyway of, of some sort. I, you know, I, I engage with writing in some way pretty much every day. Um, and then after a while, I mean, the books take like, you know, five years or something to do. And after a while, just sort of energy will start to sort of gather around certain images 
that I've been writing. I'll, they'll, they'll sort of keep returning and sort of, I'll sort of deepen them and uh, I'll be surprised by it. I'll be like, oh, this is, you know, and, and the last book, the this is the house, our, this is the night our house will catch fire, really just began as stories I would tell my daughter when she, she was really interested to know what my life was like when I was seven. When she was seven, she wanted to know what I did when I was seven. And I was like, oh, I, I don't really remember. So, uh, but I remembered one thing. I remember like one really vivid image and I would tell her that and it sort of grew from that. I sort of tried to, and we did we did it in different genres, I guess. It's like, I had her make a picture book of the story I told her. You know, we made like a song of the story I told her. We, you know, told the story again. We went to visit the place. We did all these sort of things, which were, you count as like research or, you know, trying in different ways. We storyboarded it out. Uh, and there's basically just a sort of like, like, you know, I would sort of like, you know, tell the story and then she would draw a picture of it. And, uh, um, and then, but it, it just grew from that. And then I realized that there was other stuff around, like why was I telling a story, which is also the thing for memoir. I think you always sort of, I, I always, I don't know what you need to do, but I always encourage my students also to ask themselves why they're telling that story. Like what it is about that story and not the other stories you could tell around that time. It might be that you only remember that story, but there are a lot of things I remembered around it, but they just didn't have the same energy. They didn't have the same sort of like, you know, energy enough to sort of sustain one through a book. So yeah, time for one more question. Good Lord. Oh my Lord. It published you mixed genres. I think it is. Hmm. I think it is, but I think it's changing. Um, so is it harder to get published if you mix genres? Um, I mean, we've had such interesting books come out, some really critically acclaimed books that um, are doing things with text and image and um, parts, you know what I mean? I was just looking at Dorothy, um, the, the publisher Dorothy, that does a lot with, um, you know, kind of smaller sometimes smaller books that are you know mixing things um so it, you know but but again like if you're if you're going the, the more you're pushing toward um mixing the genres and doing something that we were talking about where the borders meet you know the really interesting work happens when people are transferring themselves and moving between borders so the more you're doing that if you're doing that for an audience for you know publishers are really hungry for that and want more of that, I think that then you're in a good spot. If you want to go to a traditional publishing house, I think it's going to be harder to convince them that I'll get all the audiences, you know what I mean? Not just one, you know? So, um, and I think part of it too, for me, a book, it kind of goes to why in a way, but for me, a lot of times a book really becomes very clear when I know who I'm writing it and who I'm talking to, who, who's the one person. If I can kind of get it down to one person um, and what that person wants and needs, then that's really helpful to me um, in terms of, yeah, just the whole thing coming together and making sense. Um, I can't think about audience and like all the editors who might read it and all the readers who might, you know, read it. Um, but if I can think about one person, uh, that that helps me clarify. Nice. Um, I was I was I was looking at the question from a different. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. The question was a little. Um, you could read it two ways, like an Escher drawing or something. Like I didn't know if it was. You were, you were taking it as if the different mixing the genres with, within one book, within one project, I oh. think. And I thought maybe it was like, if you write in different genres, mm -hmm. uh, if you have a whole, if each book is a different genre. Um, I think it, if it is within one book, I think it really depends. I think people are getting much more open to having hybrid uh, work out there that's, that, that crosses those lines, like you're saying. I mean, I think there's really a... a um, an opening to speculative fiction, to having, uh, uh, you know, just to having more lyric uh, essays, to having things that are sort of like banging up against each other. I think that there's things, and, and doing it in different genres. I mean, I mean, if you do different books, um, you know, your solution is to have different authors' names, you know, you can have, you can do it with different names. You could do it like that. I, I do it the same. I don't notice, I have, I have a different publisher for my poetry, a different publisher for my, um, my prose right now. And, um, you know, I don't know if it's, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Like, it, it just seemed like, you know, it, 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 that just works for me. Like, I, I don't know. And I think, I think they're both open to it. It's not like, you don't, you don't usually have even the same readers. You often don't, do not have the same readers. Like you said, one person read your, you know, knew that your poem, you'd stuck a poem into, you know, from a book of poetry into your prose. And I, I think it'd be about the same for me too. You know, that'd be, a, that's, a, that's an excellent reader that can notice that, you know. They were so mad at me. So yeah. mad. I lost them. Um, oh, no, they were mad? so mad <laughs> um, you paid him back you to pay him back the like 
whatever that would be worth. To... <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that um, I mean, I am jealous sometimes of, of writers who, when I pick up a book, I know exactly what I'm going to get. You know what I mean? And I think sometimes with with writers like me, it's like I don't know, you pick up one of my books, you don't know what you're going to get. You know, it's kind of all over the place. So I think there is something to be said for like giving people like you know having having a voice that's very clear and distinctive. And sometimes I wish. I could do that, but I can't because I, I get bored of myself and I can't stand being myself. And so I try to try to at least do something different, you know, in order. And so there's also something to be said for, you know, agility and moving between genres to kind of also um, keep publishing across the board. I don't know. I think, I think we've come to the end. I think Tom and Jason are going to come back in and say hi now. I think. Hey, Tom. Hey guys. Great job. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thanks, Nick. No. <laughs> Fantastic. Hey, Jason. Hey, well, we made it to the end. We made it. To, how are you feeling anyway? I'm good. I'm good. I put the heating pad on my back like you suggested. <laughs> Very helpful. Very helpful. It's a lifesaver. It's a back saver. It helped me focus because there was a lot to take in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling pretty great about this little experiment that we did this year. Yeah, I loved it. Every minute of it was great. Absolutely. Absolutely. And for those of you who are still watching us, thank you so much for hanging out. I hope you had your own heating pads for uh, sitting around for so long each day. Um, and we're just thrilled that you, you were able to tune in and that we were able to bring you this programming. And we can't wait to see you next year in person at Big Arts on Sanibel Island for the 2021 20, uh, Sanibel Island Writers Conference. Jason, you want to say anything else about the, the server? The 2021 conference, you say? Is that Was that my cue? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to be back on the island. That's the plan. Um, we do have registration discount right now. If you sign up between now and Halloween, um, you can save 100 bucks on your registration fee for the conference. So it's only $450 instead of $550, which is regular price, which is what you'll pay if you don't grab it this week. Um, we also have um, four Sanibel Island hotels, the Sanibel Inn, the Sunshine Island Inn, Kona Kai, and the Sundial that are also offering discounts for Sanibel members so if you can, or uh, yeah, attendees. So if you can go to our uh, website, you've seen all the links. If you go to the Facebook page for A Mighty Blaze or for the Sanibel Island Writers Conference, you can find those links there or to our webpage ftcu.edu slash SIWC, um, you will see that all roads point you to that registration page and all the discount uh, information is on there and you can take advantage of it. We're hoping to see you guys on the island next year and really looking forward to it. As much um, fun as this has been and a different little change of pace, um, I'm ready to sit by that pool behind the hotel and swat at noceums and uh, yeah. I'm ready for that. I am so ready for that, especially now as I look out my window here and see the snow piling up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I bet. Um, well, listen, before we say goodbye, we want to say thank you because uh, putting together a program like this requires a lot of hands to do the lifting. And um, first, I want to thank, again, all of you who, who tuned in and who sent comments and questions during all of the all of the sessions, those those were really great. Uh, we love the feedback, we love the questions, and we think that it, we made it a much more dynamic conversation between all of the presenters because they were responding to your immediate needs. Uh, so thanks for that. We really appreciate uh, you collaborating with us on this. Um, especially, I wanna give a special uh, shout out to my class, the writing theory and practice students. I know you guys were all here because I saw all your comments and your and your questions. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this as as much as I did, and I hope I didn't oversell it. I hope I undersold it, and that you really felt like it was worthwhile and a lot of fun. Um, I want to thank all these people at Florida Gulf Coast University who helped make this happen and make make it possible. Uh, Dr. Fiona Tolhurst, Dr. Chuck Lindsay, President Martin, Norm Walker, Lori Cornelius. Uh, Kyle McCurry. I want to thank Nancy Stetson and Jeff Cull at Florida Weekly. I want to thank Nancy McPhee and her entire staff 
at the Lee County Visitors Bureau. I want to thank my, my good buddy, Kevin Toller, who helped design all of the ads. I want to thank everybody at A Mighty Blaze who helped produce this and make it possible for us to be online this year. Uh, that includes uh, founders and CEOs Jenna Blum and Carolyn Levitt and the entire team of Tom Shampoo, Margaret Pennard, um, Amanda Smiley, Sarah Christensen Few, Laura Rossi and Whitney Scherer. I want to thank Blue Flower Arts. Uh, they represent a bunch of the presenters who came this year, uh, especially Anya Backlund and Anna Samoz. Um, and of course, I want to thank all of the great presenters who, who presented this year, uh, who are many of whom are going to be there next year. So if you enjoyed them this year, you're going to see a bunch of them next year, including we got Aaron and Steve Almond, Andrea Askowitz, Juliana Baggett, Lynn Barrett, uh, Jenna Blum again, who not only was uh, behind A Mighty Blaze, but also a presenter and a moderator a bunch of times. Uh, Mahogany L. Brown, Augustine Burroughs, Joe Clifford, John Dufresne, Camille Dungy, Beth Ann Fennelly, Nick Flynn, Lisa Gallagher, Todd Goldberg, Christina Baker Klein, Allison Langer, Ron McLean, Joyce Maynard, Christopher Schelling, John Schimmel, Jeffrey Thompson, Brian Turner, and Stephen Womack. On behalf of myself and Jason Ellick, thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next year on the island.